interesting because we're at this 50th anniversary celebration and the anniversary goes from 1963 to now, 2013. And 1963 is the year I graduated from college. And, um, and the courses started up in the OTS then. I didn't know about them. I went to Woods Hole and that was my field course experience. And after 1963, I was in grad school and I, I started my field research right away. So I, and I wasn't in the mood for any courses. So it, even if I'd known there were OTS courses I could have gone to, I wouldn't have wanted to do it because I was busily trying to escape courses and pass the graduate exam, which was really tough then. And I, in my, right away I started my research on social loss because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So, in my first year in grad school, I taught a, uh, an accelerated beginning biology course. I was a teaching fellow in that course. I mean, I didn't teach the whole course. But there was a student in there who, needed, who was a foreign student at, at the University of Michigan where I was. Um, and he was having a lot of trouble with the lab reports. And they were, they were very demanding. Um, they had to be in the form of a scientific paper and they had to be in good English and he was having a lot of trouble with them. So I spent a lot of time helping him. Um, and then when the course was over, oh, I got a NIH traineeship and it had $300 travel money in it. <laughs> and so I started, I had already done I, by then a year of research in Michigan, which was the northern limit of the insects I was studying. And I was vaguely thinking I'd like to do a comparison with some tropical species, but it was like a dream kind of vague um, wish that wasn't going to materialize if I didn't get thinking about it more. Anyway, that summer I happened to meet this student uh, in Ann Arbor just down the street, and he said, oh, how are you? And I said, hello. <laughs> he said, um, oh, and what are you going to do next year? And so, of course, I didn't want to act as if I didn't know what I was going to do the next year, so I said, oh, I might go to the tropics and do some, do some research. And he said, oh, if you want to do that, I'm from Columbia, and I can set it up for you. And so I, uh, of course, I mean, I didn't, I, he said he was from Columbia. Actually, I, I couldn't really remember whether it was Costa Rica or Colombia because they both started with C, but he was pretty definite about it. And, and actually, just to make sort of a long story short, he had been the chairman of the Department of Biology in the Universidad del Valle in Cali, Colombia. He was up there on a um, Rockefeller Foundation grant because they were trying to upgrade the university and, and, um, uh, and so he was going to get a PhD in the U.S. Um, I used my $300 to buy a ticket on a very slow, the cheapest airfare I could get was an Equatoriana flight that that went from Miami and just droned and droned. I couldn't believe, you know, how long the trip was, and I couldn't believe the gas was going <laughs> to last in this place. Anyway, um, that's how I got started, basically. That's how I ended up doing tropical research. It was extremely exciting um, for me, having never flown an airplane before even, and to land in Cali, um, and the research itself, the comparison with the temperate zone species was um, kind of set me up for the rest of my career, actually. Then after that, I had a postdoc at Harvard, and that's where I met my husband, Bill. And he was finishing his thesis, and um, we, we didn't have any definite plans. Actually, um, I was contacted by Charles Michener about whether, whether I might be interested in Dan Jansen's position at uh, the University of Kansas because oh, he really? was leaving. But Bill said he didn't want to live in Kansas and all of a sudden I realized I had to take him into account when yeah, I made yeah. these decisions. So um, then we had a visit from one of the people I knew in college, a professor who happened to visit Boston. We had him over for dinner and he said, why don't we go to Columbia? So Bill, that sounded good to him. He had a, uh, a passport because he had wanted to go to the tropics and hadn't done it. So we just decided to go. They made a job for Bill that helped convince us. Um, we, we, it looked like a good salary, but what we didn't realize is that the dollar sign meant pesos. <laughs> and, it, and it was actually, it wasn't the annual salary. It, was the, it, it looked good in dollars. It was the monthly salary. And we had no clue what, what our finances were going to be, but we didn't care.
<laughs> so we had one uh, almost one year old child when we went. That's how we happened to go into the tropics. Yeah. And what was it like working in Cali? Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, <laughs> we we were both doing research that didn't require big grants. It was wonderful for both of us. Mm -hmm. um, Bill had n not known Spanish at all, and he mastered it amazingly quickly. Um, he had to start out teaching as soon as we got there. He was lecturing in, in Spanish and had a little dictionary and learned to look up <laughs> words really fast. I knew a l little more because I'd been there before. Um, and I didn't have a, a job at all, but I, ha I knew what I wanted to do. And there were wasps in our, in our backyard, basically. And so I did a lot of my work there. And I was happy with that because we eventually had three kids. Um, and, and they were, and that was while we were in Cali. But the research part was just an unbelievably rewarding and exciting. And the people were wonderful. We had all the help we needed. We didn't need money because we were doing um, behavior observations. We had cameras. We, we had the kind of equipment we needed. We had a typewriter. Um, and uh, we also, this was all facilitated because um, we didn't have much money, but you didn't need much to have someone help in the house. So we had a, a, a maid. We never wanted to have a nanny, but we, we had a, a very su sweet, kind-hearted woman for a maid. And we could always trust her with our kids. So I had, it was like having a, a, a resident babysitter, basically. So that was a huge help. But I always worked at home and Bill did a lot of work at home. Anyway, that, that's important because one reason the research was so much fun is that we, we could do it and not feel yes. the, the, the burden as if it was a big burden having these kids. Yes. yes. So, but, but basically, the, the success in research was automatic because it, we, we so often saw things that were exciting. They were species that were new. I mean, like in the, in the nursery school where one of our kids was, there was a zethus nest. It was a classic study of, of um, subsocial wasps that I'd read about that had been done at the turn of the, ninth, of the century in Brazil, and here was in this, right there in Cali, where we were going every day to pick up our kids, was a nest of this thing. I mean, it, it, you, you can hardly, maybe you can't imagine the excitement <laughs> of that. But, so I would drop everything and, and I mean, and do that, and look at that net, and you, it was, you just couldn't go wrong. So, uh, and you, and the fact we didn't need grants also was important. The two universities, actually, where we've been, um, Universidad del Valle just did, it was basically undergrads in biology, and that was, Bill was teaching them. Um, and then there were, he's had lots of master's students, and I've never been in a, in a position where I could have students. But um, the, I always, you know, I think I often got to know his students, yes. but he's really been the one that's been yeah. teaching, and he's, yeah. I think I can fairly say he's a wonderful teacher, and I think, you know. Yes quite well known for that. Yeah. And, and so we, we sort of had a division of labor in the family. Um, one of the things I kind of learned is you can't do everything. <laughs> and, and I very much wanted to teach when I was a student. And actually, I had a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, which was for to encourage college teaching. I didn't take it because I stayed at Michigan. You had to go some, to a, some other institution. But um, I was always proud of that. But it's just something that, that ended up, I ended up, I've had advisees. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I like to think that some of the things I've written have inspired students. Uh, yeah. I like to think of it that way. But I greatly admire good teaching, but yeah. just never yeah. was in a job where I w I've always had a research job. So we were in Cali for ten years. We went on a Bill had a sabbatical. We went to the Anos Orientales, which was very exciting research. And then when we came back from that trip, when we went home at night we saw bright lights in vacant fields near our house. And what happened was there'd been a, a settlement of squatters right around our house. And so it became a place we couldn't live. But we had already been thinking of leaving Cali because our kids were growing up and the security situation in Cali was changing. There were a lot of, um, and, and so we just decided it might be time to, to move even though we'd been very happy there. So um, meanwhile, in Cali, we'd had contact with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute with STRI. And 
I, since Phil had a full-time job, they began by, by giving us um, a stipend, like $2,000 a year. That was in 1973. We went to Cali in 69, so. Um, yeah. And then my position was made eventually half-time. Well, so when we decided we really had to move, um, we, we had a meeting in the U.S. Anyway, we, we were offered a a university job, a split position in the U.S., but we, we interviewed at Stry uh, about what could be the arrangement there. And, and eventually, we, Bill wanted, was interested in teaching in Costa Rica, and the students were really pushing for him to go and teach there, and really the students made a position. So we negotiated with Stry to have two half-time positions, in, in, but not live in Panama, but live in Costa Rica. So that, that was kind of an odd arrangement. It showed huge flexibility on the part of Ira Rubinoff, really, who was the director then. Um, our, the deal was if we kept active, we, my, our, my position could move eventually to, toward full time. So I went from half time to three quarters to seven eighths. <laughs> and by 1986, I was full time. <laughs> so, uh, but I think we kept, the, the deal was uh, we, this could happen, and, um, but we had to keep productive, and I think we kept up our, yeah. both of us. I think we um, feel tremendously in, indebted to Stry for having been flexible and for having made it possible for us to um, be, be, be financially okay and not have that worry and, and to live a whole life in the tropics where we could, in my case, I could continue to, to work at home, but the, but just I think the excitement of it really came from the from our interest in um, concepts, and at the same time being interested in organisms and being able to live with those organisms, to have them in our backyard, um, and, and 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 it's like picking the low hanging fruit sort of. <laughs> it, it it was very easy to find interesting research, and I think that's still true in the tropics. Yeah. Um, especially if you're in an area where, you, like, if you want to do animal behavior, if you want to do some kinds of ecology, don't have to be big money. And I'm yeah. sort of hoping that we'll get past the point where yeah. big money yeah. matters. Um, that I would, I think, if I had any advice, I'd kind of encourage people to look for things they love, where they do feel a passion for it, and where the passion doesn't have to do with how much money you can raise. <laughs> but of course I also realize that it's part of the modern world. <laughs>